Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 10 of the course Applied Seismology for Engineers. Myself Dr. Abhishek Kumar. In lecture 9, we have discussed that whenever there are earthquakes in a particular region, these may trigger damages to the building, these may cause other kind of induced effects. So, whenever one is interested to find out what is the potential ground motion which is expected to occur at a particular site of interest, we can go for hazard assessment. Now, hazard assessment or as far as the earthquake occurrence is concerned, mostly these will be associated with respect to faults. However, considering the information or considering limited information about faults which are present in a particular region, many a times we will encounter there is an event, but there is no fault which has been mapped so far or there is no information about a fault in a particular region. So, how in such case one can go for source characterization we have discussed in previous class. Also we discussed in brief about what are aerial sources, what are linear sources, what are point sources and how these information about the sources in conjunction with information about past earthquakes collectively can be given more information about seismic activity, more information about uh, what are the areas which are experiencing more frequent earthquakes, what are the areas which are experiencing relatively lesser earthquakes. In the end, we also touched upon the seismic activity parameters. So, we, we just discuss about what is uh, the Gutenberg Richter law, which correlates the cumulative number of earthquakes of m or greater magnitudes happening in a particular region of interest in terms of a minus b times m. So, we discuss what will be the influence in terms of interpreting the seismic activity when we have very high a value, when we have very low a value and subsequently what will be the interpretation if we are linking the seismic activity with respect to b value. Higher is the b value we can say lower is the seismic activity. So, with that brief uh, discussion about uh, source as well as seismic activity uh, information, we will continue this particular topic. As I mentioned in earlier classes also, usually there will be damages which will be witnessed in maybe last couple of decades, maybe one, one and a half century, but whenever it comes to design part, whenever it comes to assessment of what is the potential earthquake loading likely to come during the design life of the earthquake, we have to have a broader understanding about what has happened in the past in terms of primarily when the earthquake has happened, where the earthquake had happened and what was the size of those earthquakes. In later classes, we will also discuss about paleo seismic investigations, which will help us in identifying historic earthquakes, which might have happened 600, 700, 1000 years back. At present, we do not have any information, but based on paleo seismic investigations, looking into primary uh, signatures and then going for detailed investigation, one can identify many more characteristics of historic earthquakes, which were not known before such investigations are taken up. So, continuing with the topic of uh, earthquake catalog and seismic activity, seismic activity we discussed in last class. In today's uh, lecture uh, 10, we will also discuss about what is earthquake catalog, what is the importance of earthquake catalog. As I mentioned just now, that very limited information about the earthquakes happening in a particular region is available, primarily because, firstly because the, the recording or instrumentation of earthquake recording instruments in a particular region has been a very recent activity, last in last 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. So, if you see the number of earthquakes which have been witnessed since the recording stations have been installed, will give you some information about maybe small to moderate earthquakes, but when you talk about earthquakes which are happening maybe once in 500 years, once in 1000 years, means the earthquake which are corresponding to very high return period, certainly with limited information generated from earthquake record for the last 40, 50 years, getting information about earthquakes which are having a frequency of one earthquake in at least 500 to 700 years will be almost impossible. 
So, on one side we have to have an understanding about what is the true uh, potential seismic potential of a particular region, but at the same time we are having the earthquake catalog which is very limited in terms of uh, spatial distribution as well as temporal distribution. So, let us look at uh, the earthquake catalog, what is the meaning of earthquake catalog and what are the processes, manual processes which one have to uh, do on the earthquake catalog before you can start looking and analyzing this earthquake catalog for further information. So, earthquake catalog as we know that preparedness once we are told like I have to design a particular building or I have to look into the retrofitting of a particular building then certainly I will take into account what are the damages which have happened in the past. Similarly, if I am interested to find out what is the seismic force story shear likely to be witnessed by a building which I am going to design and construct today and which will be exposed to earthquake loading condition for next 35, 40, 50 years depending upon the design life of the structure. Then I have to definitely refer to whatever information is available with us in terms of past earthquake as well as seismic sources. So, in lecture 9 we discuss about seismic sources, in lecture 10 we will be discussing particularly about the earthquake events. So, earthquake catalog, so, so if we go with that part the preparedness for future earthquake in a particular location is only possible if one knows about the true potential in terms of earthquake occurrence or to seismic potential of a particular region. When we say about seismic potential that means, we are interested to know how accurately we can get the information about what size of earthquakes are potential to occur in a particular region. If we are talking about stable region, we may look into 4, 4.5, 5 magnitude earthquakes, but on the other hand if we are dealing with very high active region, highly seismically active region given example of northeast India. So, then we can have even major to greater earthquakes also likely to occur in the design life of the structure. So, this is one possibility. So, in order to understand the true potential one has to also understand how it has responded in the past. When we say about responded definitely one uh, uh, information which will be required is earthquake catalog. So, in order to understand the true seismicity or true seismic potential, what is the potential of a particular region to create different magnitude earthquakes, how frequently these earthquakes can be uh, repeated during a particular fault or collectively in a particular region that is the meaning of true seismic potential. So, what is the true seismic potential of a particular region? Such information of a particular region of interest can be determined from lot many agencies. So, in addition to seismic uh, sources like one can refer to seismic atlas map provided by different agencies in India geological survey of India also provides seismic atlas map. So, one can refer to those map to get updated information about seismic sources. Similarly, about past information we can get to know from lot many sources some of them are listed over here also. So, when we talk about past earthquakes what actually we are intended to understand is what was the location of earthquake which has already happened, what was the size of the earthquake, what was the magnitude of that earthquake. Mostly we are interested in magnitude if some earthquake has happened prehistorically we can have some understanding about the intensity of that earthquake and using uh, available correlation may be regional correlation or global correlation such intensity values can also be converted to how much was expected peak ground acceleration at different different levels. So, time and date when the earthquake has happened throughout a particular time which month which day and which year the particular earthquake has happened. So, we are interested to know more and more about the earthquake as the earthquake has happened in today's uh, date same thing we are interested to know about past earthquake it can start with the location, it can start with the time, it can start with the size, even the focal depth if the there is possibility of getting focal depth we can determine the focal depth, we can gather the focal depth. Similarly, focal mechanism we discussed in earlier slides also in, in earlier lectures also that whenever there is release of energy happening at the fault plane it might be resultant of particular movement of two fault blocks 
it can be related to normal faulting, reverse faulting, strike slip faulting, dip slip faulting, thrust faulting. So, what was the tentative focal mechanism of historic earthquake or any earthquake which has happened in the past? So, these are primarily the information which one should look into when we are exploring past earthquakes in a particular region. And remember, the objective is how accurately one can determine the true seismic potential of a particular region. Now, any earthquake catalog, when we say about earthquake catalog, that means we are trying to develop a comprehensive database, a very systematic database of earthquakes which have happened in comparison to present in the past and most likely should be covering all these information which are listed over here including the location, the size, the focal depth, focal mechanism, when it had happened, all this information. If some information is not there, we will try to get the other information and try to get more and more information such that whatever event have happened in the past, I should have complete information about those events. Later, I, once I will uh, start analyzing those events, I will get more and more interpretation about the true potential, true seismic potential, true seismic activity of a particular region or I can say accurate seismic potential, accurate seismic activity of a particular region. So, again if I am interested to go for uh, hazard assessment in a particular city, I can go with particular region, how many earthquakes have happened in maybe, if this is my site of interest, then how many particular region in your site of interest has happened, which might be ranging from 500 kilometer, 600 kilometer radial distance or to as low as 200, 250 radial uh, kilometer radial distance. So, within this particular site and keeping a radial distance of suppose 500 kilometer, so within this particular radial distance, what are the events which have already happened in the past, we will try to gather information, what is referred to as past earthquake information. In addition, source information will come as we discussed in uh, uh, the previous lecture. So, so, the information about past earthquake can be referred to various sources or various catalogs. There are different agencies which can provide you information about past earthquakes. Some of these are listed over here also. So, at national level, international level also there are different agencies. At times, you can just enter the center point coordinates or the coordinates latitude to longitude of your site of interest and also tell how much radial distance, whether in terms of kilometer or in terms of degree, whatever these agencies asked and then you can get information about past earthquakes, which have happened within that particular radial distance, giving your latitude to longitude of the site or within latitude to longitude range of your area of interest or region of interest and that will give you past earthquake information. As I mentioned, over here also there are number of agencies. Some agencies will give you uh, uh, data more about historic earthquake data, some agency will give you region specific data. So, primarily I have mentioned over here also Indian meteorological department one can refer to whenever there is an earthquake, they will give updated information about where earthquake has happened, focal depth and at time focal mechanism also. Geological survey of India as I mentioned seismic atlas maps are there based on which you can get more information about historic earthquakes and this keeps on getting updated at regular interval. So, you can get more information in terms of earthquake as well as in terms of seismic sources which have been identified up till uh, the current time. Then United States Geological Survey you can refer to, you can get lot more information about past earthquakes. So, 1, 2, 3 and then International Seismological Center ISC is there, again from there you can get more information about past earthquakes and information again refer to size, location, focal depth, focal mechanism and when the earthquake has happened. Then GCMT catalog also is there, again when you go to GCMT catalog in addition to the information which was mentioned over there, many a times we will also get to know focal mechanism in terms of nodal plane, uh, nodal plane solution. So, you can get to know what is the strike and dip value for nodal plane 1, what is the strike and dip value for nodal plane 2. Here I am referring to nodal plane related to uh, one is fault plane and other one is auxiliary plane. You can refer to the corresponding note which is which we have discussed about fault plane solution. So, one is auxiliary plane, one is fault plane. Using these two we can determine 
what is the potential fault pane mechanism during a particular earthquake. So, these also can be uh, obtained from different agencies. Then in addition one can refer to existing literature because in, uh, in India particularly many a times you also refer to Oldham catalogue which is composed of lot more information about historic earthquakes. Recently in 2010 there was a report on probabilistic seismic hazard uh, map of India development of probabilistic seismic hazard map of India by national disaster management authority. So, again from there you can refer to and get more information primarily related to India and adjoining regions which might govern the seismic hazard of Indian territory. So, those things you can get more information about past earthquakes. So, that whether you are going with agencies which are listed over here or whether in addition to those agencies you are also referring to some additional literature which are also presenting historic earthquakes. So, you can refer to more and more agencies to get to, to ensure that none of the event which have actually happened will be missed in your earthquake catalog. In the background when you are going through these agencies collecting the data you are you are basically developing a data set of which particular year, which particular latitude longitude, which magnitude, when a particular earthquake of what focal depth has happened and potentially what was the focal mechanism of that earthquake. So, once you start analyzing it you will see in the end you will come across large number of data set or large number of earthquakes which have happened. One can refer to lecture 9 also. So, there I have shown some seismotectonic maps where information about past earthquake was clearly highlighted. So, if you collect past earthquake information and superimpose on a map where site is located based on latitude longitude and the radial distance around the site within which one is interested to develop earthquake catalog if that particular map is ready, one can simply superimpose the past earthquake information which is collected from these sites and then you can see what is the distribution of earthquake in that particular region. Now, this is about uh, collecting information about past earthquakes. Here it is very clear that whenever we are collecting information from more than one sources, while on one side we are ensuring that we should not leave any one event which has actually happened to be a part of earthquake catalog. At the same time because we are collecting for same region past earthquake information from more than one source, there are definitely chances that one event which has actually happened might be repeated, might be reported by IMD also, GSI also, USGS also, ISC also, GCMT catalog also or any of these more than one catalog or resources. In such a case once you are developing a catalog definitely you will be having more than once a particular event or many number of events which have actually been reported in your earthquake catalog more than once. Now, try considering that there is a reason, there, there is a region in which in actual four earthquakes has happened, but because of repetition of events or collection of events from different sources and the catalog consisting of same event multiple times rather than four events which have actually happened, you will end up in stating that this particular region has experienced 12 events. Now, in comparison to 4 events which have actually happened, if you, if you came to know that 12 event have happened, then suddenly the question comes to mind is suddenly there is significant increase in the seismic activity of a particular region. In actual there is no increase in seismic activity, but you have not removed those dependent events or you have not removed those repeated events from the earthquake catalog, you will mostly end up in overestimating the true potential of a particular region or overestimating the seismic activity of a particular region. So, this, this is one uh, scenario same way many more things are there which will help in processing this earthquake catalog such that this kind of repetition of events or other complications which may arise if you do not treat the earthquake catalog properly. Uh, so, one how that has to be dealt with we will discuss these in coming slides. So, for the development of earthquake catalog now we have collected past earthquake information so far. Now, we have to develop this earthquake catalog that means, now whatever earthquake catalog or database I am going to develop that is going to give me true information about seismic potential, maximum magnitude of the earthquake and even in terms of focal depth distribution even in terms of dominating fault mechanism also. 
and of course, you will continue this to determine the seismic activity and true potential rupture characteristics of a particular region. So, lot much uh, applications or requirements are there which can be fulfilled once a particular earthquake catalog is developed. So, here as I mentioned you can collect information about past earthquakes from multiple sources. Since you are collecting from multiple sources there are chances that same event might be getting repeated for more than one times definitely that will result in overestimation of true seismic potential of a particular region. In such a case these duplicate events duplicate means one was the event which has actually happened and similar event has been repeated more than once because same database you, you, uh, the information about past earthquake you are also collecting from GSI you are also collecting from IMD you are also collecting from uh, uh, NDMA report you are also collecting from USGS. So, the same event which has happened once but it getting repeating 3 times 4 times. So, one event might be correct and rest all are duplicate events. So, these are not actually the event which have happened, but are the duplicate events which are being reported because you are collecting database from uh, more than one site. So, these duplicate events are there which must be removed otherwise you will end up in overestimating the true potential and it is not like uh, overestimating is ok because later on you may use it for design of different utilities you may also help in uh, 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 determining the ground shaking surface ground motion scenarios. So, certainly this will have multifold impact on your design parameters. So, one cannot continue with the duplicate parameters and determine the true potential or seismic activity of a particular region. So, in general not all the earthquake magnitude in addition we discussed about uh, multiple events. So, one is actual event and other than one is duplicate events. In addition whenever we are collecting data about different different uh, 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 from different different sources and even in different different times like from 1980 you are having or like uh, from 1985 majority of the data is available in one magnitude scale before 1985 data is available in different magnitude scale. So, that means though you are collecting data from different different uh, sources data is also available in different different magnitude scale. As we discussed in our earlier lectures that recording of earthquake you can have it in local magnitude or Richter magnitude scale magnitude can be also determined in terms of surface wave magnitude, body wave magnitude and then very recent moment magnitude. So, again to, to look at the entire earthquake catalog collected from uh, understanding the true potential we should have all the past earthquake information on same scale. So, that is called as homogenization in homogenization what we will do we will truck, we will convert all the data whether it was reported in body wave magnitude, local magnitude, surface wave magnitude or moment magnitude to one particular scale. Mostly nowadays we convert every magnitude to seismic moment magnitude or MW scale. So, one can refer to different different correlations are there <coughs> one can explore uh, literature to come across the correlation which have been developed across the globe and even if you are interested to do region specific study you can again search for region specific correlations. Many a time such correlations are available region specific level if not then one can refer to regions which are having similar seismic activity across the globe and other tectonic setting comparison also there, if there is similarity one can adopt correlations for such times of conversion from different parts of the globe. Now, here just to quote so there is a correlation which is given again of course, this correlation is also applicable to certain range of magnitude using this correlation the earthquake catalog which is available in body wave magnitude you can convert it to moment magnitude. Similarly, if it is given in surface wave magnitude you can convert it to moment magnitude. So, applying these correlation and similarly for local magnitude also, also one can uh, refer to some correlation and uh, of course, when you are using this particular correlation one has to also refer to what is the range for which this particular correlation is applicable, what is the range for this particular correlation is applicable. So, one has to only apply the correlation in the range in which the correlation you are going to use is valid. So, that is how uh, we have simply more than these two correlation which are available even for global scale even for regional scale also one can refer to those correlations and convert 
the data which is reported in different different magnitude scale to uniform magnitude scale or same magnitude scale which in this particular case is moment magnitude scale. So, before using appropriate correlation one has to make sure that the correlation which you are using is actually applicable to that site of interest. Same way the correlation you are using is actually applicable to that range of magnitude which is available in your earthquake catalog. So, using these two information one can definitely refer to and select to many more correlation and pick up most appropriate correlation which can be used for homogenization of earthquake catalog or for conversion of earthquake catalog from different magnitude to uh, moment magnitude scale. Now, removal of duplicate events as I mentioned now you have converted all the magnitude to moment magnitude scale, but still there are duplicate events which are there. If you do not remove those events you will end up in overestimating the true potential of a particular region. Now, duplicate events can be identified from the catalog by observing that there are events which are happening almost on the same date. After date you go to the location of course, the, 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 the location wise if you say in terms of latitude and longitude of events which some of events are happening on similar date even latitude longitude wise also are happening in closer range. Mostly it will be exactly or maybe uh, you can refer to what is the range in which uh, one can refer to as similar uh, event. In addition, if you refer to magnitude value of such events which have happened almost at same time at the same location even the magnitude is same. So, the all three conditions that means, the date of occurrence, the time of occurrence, the location of occurrence and even the magnitude of those earthquakes are almost matching that is clearly giving you a hint that this is not certainly that at one place more than once the same event has happened at the same day. Rather it is like the event has been repeated because it has been collected from different different sources. After identifying different events duplicate events only one event which generally we say like if 10 events are there which are exactly falling at the same location and that happened at same time then the event which is generally corresponding to maximum magnitude. Suppose even magnitudes are difference of um, I mean all the duplicate events are having difference in magnitude by 0 0.1, 0 0.2 then the magnitude of event which is uh, the event which is having highest magnitude you consider that as main event and rest of the event you consider as duplicate events. So, that is how one can remove duplicate events firstly we find out similarity in terms of location in terms of time of occurrence then in terms of magnitude. So, magnitude as I mentioned 0 0.1, 0 0.2 difference you can observe, but if there is similarity in terms of location and time of occurrence one can separate those events and among those events the event which is corresponding to maximum magnitude is generally considered as the actual event and rest of the event are considered as duplicate event which can be removed from the earthquake catalog. The information about the past earthquakes left in the catalog can be utilized to understand pa the past seismic history of the region which is primarily related to what is the seismic activity rate of a particular region. Now, you have removed the information about duplicate events and the earthquake catalog is also homogeneous. Now, it can be used to understand about what is the seismic activity rate of a particular region or at times we can also forecast what is the uh, return period of different earthquakes if, if you go to completeness analysis which we will discuss later. Then what is the maximum magnitude which have occurred in a particular region. So, in last 50 years, 60 years, 100 years if one has not witnessed 8 magnitude earthquake, but <coughs> while collecting data for historic earthquakes you came across another event which which was of magnitude suppose 8.5, 8.6 certainly it will raise an alarm like though my region of interest has not experienced any earthquake of above 6.5, 6.7, but historical record says that even this particular region is capable of producing 8.7 magnitude earthquake. So, that is going to give you what is the true potential of seismic activity in a particular region. Now, whether this magnitude is going to get repeated or not one has to take decision and appropriately one uh, will take with suitable probability of occurrence in the hazard assessment. So, earthquake catalog declustering, declustering generally we use so that 
once even after removing duplicate events, there will be some events generally whenever uh, uh, there is building up of strain energy, there will be some, some uh, shocks which might be happening before main shock. Similarly, there will be some event which will be uh, resemblance of redistribution of seismic energy at the source after the actual event has happened, which are generally referred to as aftershocks. So, after you have removed declustered uh, uh, duplicate events, again in uh, your earthquake catalog, there are some events which are not actually independent. That means, some event has happened before that particular event has happened, there were some small, small force shocks. So, those are not actually representing the seismicity of a particular region, because those are indication of some larger earthquake might have happened at certain time. Similarly, whenever some aftershock has happened, which is again the redistribution of energy after a main shock has happened. So, so whether you talk about aftershock or whether you shock, uh, talk about force shocks, these are basically considered as dependent event of main event. In other words, it is like these events have happened because one main event whether it is about to happen or had occurred in the past. So, these events are again considered as dependent event. If we do not remove aftershocks and force shocks again very much similar to duplicate events, we will end up in overestimating the true seismic potential of a particular region. So, then we will go for declustering of earthquake catalog that means removal of dependent events and only taking into account main events or independent events. So, independent event or main event, these are the events which are assumed to mostly be caused by tectonic loading. So, these are the governing features which are leading to cause of independent and main events. If you talk about dependent event, these are the events which might be related to static or dynamic stress change. It might be because of after slip reaction of the fault plane or any other mechanical process, which actually release whatever pending energy was there before there is subsequent in building up of strain energy for next earthquake event. So, these are dependent event and the previous one was main event or independent event. The process of separating dependent event from independent event it is called as declustering. So, generally it is very important to separate those events. So, that now once you have removed dependent event you have also removed duplicate event and now the Kartko catalog what is the whatever is available with you are consisting it consists of each event which is independent in itself and the repetition of each of these event has to have some understanding about the seismic activity of a particular region of interest. So, independent event can help us to find out the relation about long term seismic hazard of a particular region. Similarly, dependent event can help us in understanding the potential aftershock after a large magnitude earthquake and this can also help in short term uh, earthquake occurrence understanding. So, declustering there are different ways based on which one can identify where, where is uh, independent event, where is dependent event. Window method which is mentioned over here it is uh, very popularly used. So, here one can refer to window method and then I have given some reference of some of the papers uh, uh, based on which one can refer to window method and different correlations have been given based on which one can pick up whether what is the spatial window, what is the temporal window within which if a particular event is falling you call that particular event as dependent event. Consider the governing equation which is given over here. So, if I pick up a particular event of magnitude m, now put in this particular equation you will get what is the temp, uh, what is the spatial distribution within which, uh, what is the temporal distribution within which if another event has happened that might be an a dependent event of this particular magnitude m. In addition, we will also find out what is the temporal distribution or uh, what is the spatial distribution. So, from d s we will try to find out same event which has which has shown some dependency with respect to time, if it is also falling within the spatial or uh, distance window of the same event. Suppose, I am having an event of magnitude 6, I am interested to find out what other events are there which can be considered as dependent event of this 6 magnitude earthquake. I will put magnitude 6 over here also, here also, then try to find out 
within an, a particular ds distance what additional events have happened these events might be dependent event of 6 magnitude earthquake in order to further qualify it again i will determine ts value so within that particular time window the all the events which are within ds those will be considered as dependent event of magnitude 6 event similarly if if you if after 6 magnitude also some bigger earthquake has happened again bigger earthquake will try to determine the value of ts as well as ds it may happen that for next event the 6 magnitude earthquake becomes a dependent event so because of 6 smaller magnitude earthquakes been removed now because of further larger magnitude within which uh, within whose ds and ts values even 6 magnitude earthquake is also uh, identified as dependent event now that will also be removed so all depends upon what is the distance and time windows of the event of interest with respect to which you are trying to quantify what are the dependent events so finally using this window or other methods one can refer to you will try to identify what is the independent event or main event and what are its dependent event which are supposed to be removed in the process of declustering so same thing we can see over here there is temporal window there is special window consider event magnitude 5 based on these guidelines which are given in the previous slide i can find out how much is the spatial distribution of an event which should be called as dependent event of this magnitude 5 event in addition we will also try to find out what is the radial distance within which the, uh, the temporal uh, distance uh, temporal window within which an event if have occurred within this special window will be also classified as dependent event and at the same time magnitude 5 has occurred so in first case you see four magnitude earthquake has happened which is falling within the temporal and special window of magnitude 5 now this earthquake in first case it has happened this based on this understanding as I mentioned if there are multiple events generally the event corresponding to higher magnitude will be classified as main event because that will have more effect on terms of hazard assessment. So, this is become main event and magnitude 4 because it has happened after so that can be called as aftershock. In the other case there was magnitude 5 event based on which you started finding out magnitude 4 as event which is a dependent event of magnitude 5. Once you went to another earthquake which has happened again in the same or when you start analyzing another earthquakes spatial and temporal window you found out that this magnitude 5 which earlier was an independent event now will be classified as dependent event because it is falling within the temporal as well as spatial window of magnitude 7 event. Now, it these two may be correlated, these two may be may not be correlated also. That means this magnitude 5 event and this magnitude 5 event may be the same event or it may be two depend, uh, different events happening in two different geographical locations. So, in first case, because 4 magnitude earthquake was identified as dependent event of magnitude 5 and also occurred after magnitude 5, it is called as aftershock of 5 magnitude earthquake. In this particular case, in second case, 7 magnitude earthquake which actually happened after a 5 magnitude earthquake, but based on the spatial and temporal window uh, classifies this m magnitude 5 earthquake as dependent event of 7 magnitude. In this particular case, magnitude 5 will become forward shock, magnitude 7 will become after shock, uh, main event. And after 7 magnitude, there can be another earthquake of smaller magnitude which can be classified as dependent event or independent event depend upon whether it is falling within the temporal and spatial window of 7 magnitude earthquake or not. So, you can see more than one events are there. So, because of 7 magnitude, 5 magnitude earthquake was declared as dependent event. Because of 7 magnitude, later on even if this was main shock there might be some aftershocks because of this particular earthquake as happened in this particular case. So, another event which was maybe 6 magnitude, 5 magnitude, 4 magnitude will now become aftershock of 7 magnitude earthquake. 
So, in this particular case, 7 magnitude earthquake has magnitude 5 as foreshock and subsequent events as aftershocks. Now, there are clustering methods again based on which you can refer to and find out what are the events which are basically defined as dependent event. This is another method which is uh, widely used to find out the spatial as well as temporal interaction of one event with respect to another event. As mentioned over here, two events are considered in a cluster when a new event is associated with another event which was previously associated with the cluster. Then this particular new event will also be a part of the cluster and then the cluster will start growing. Same way, if there if two events are there from two different cluster and based on later event it is found that this particular two event these particular two events are also linked with respect to each other. So, what we will do we will club these two events as well as independent cluster of these two events and then the cluster will grow. So, what all events are falling within that particular cluster corresponding to maximum magnitude you call it as main event and rest all generally you classified as dependent event. So, that is called as clustering method you have to find out linking of the cluster based on the events which have been reported within a particular spatial and temporal distribution. So, in this particular case as far as you are finding there is linking between the cluster the cluster keeps on growing. If you do not find any kind of linking small small clusters will be there all throughout and within each cluster there will be one main event and rest all will be dependent event which based on the declustering process will be removed. In particular the largest event or the largest magnitude event largest magnitude event as I mentioned why largest magnitude because if larger magnitude is there that will have more effect in terms of hazard assessment or even in terms of damage because all these earthquakes are more or less happening at the same time and more or less in the same location. So, if we discuss in terms of distance or in terms of time of occurrence that is not changing between the dependent event and an independent event only thing which is changing is slight change in the magnitude. So, to consider the worst scenario we will go with the magnitude which is corresponding to higher value as main event and rest of the events are dependent event and will be removed. So, other events are considered as dependent event and later on in the process of declustering one can refer to or ref, uh, remove those events. So, now you are having a class earthquake information you started uh, collecting then remove the duplicate events based on the location size and magnitude. Later on you homogenize the catalog convert all the earthquakes into same magnitude scale. After that whether you are going with window method or you are going with clustering method you have actually separated what are the independent event and what are corresponding dependent event to those independent events. So, after declustering you will only have earthquake catalog which is homogenized and only consisting of independent events. So, more clusters this is again completeness analysis what is the meaning of completeness analysis is how much complete how much information which where I can say I have the complete information about the earthquake which are happening in a particular region. So, that is called as complete information that means, if I am interested to find out uh, the return period of a particular earthquake or I am interested to find out the seismic activity of a particular region I have to have complete information unless I am ensured that the information which is given to me about past earthquake is incomplete is complete I cannot uh, accurately determine the seismic activity of a particular region. Given example here is for accurate firstly for accurate assessment of seismic potential one has to have confidence that the information though I will be having earthquake catalog for 2000 years, but if I am asked like uh, uh, suppose before uh, 1950 some damages have happened or some intensity maps are available that is how information about earthquakes were available to me. So, definitely in comparison to the time when recordings are there large number of seismic arrays are also available such that no earthquake event can be missed certainly before 60 years before 100 years as you go deeper into history the information about actual earthquake occurrence will be very limited 
some damage might have happened, some field investigation might have happened, someone might have correlated with respect to the intensity scales. So, this will grow, uh, this will go back maybe 100, 150 years, but beyond that though earthquake information is available, but whether that information about all the earthquake is available that will be highly uncertain. So, one have, once we are trying to understand the seismic activity for the future, we have to have more confidence about the information which is available to us that is that comes under completeness analysis. Given over here also one we can see on left hand side you are having uh, on um, x axis you are having number of events which have happened in a particular region in every decade. On y axis you are having cumulatively uh, I mean how many number of events have happened. So, on y axis you are having number of events which have happened on and on x axis you are having in which particular decade. Now, if we see very much similar to the current situation 2015 onward because we are having good, good distribution of seismic arrays, there are number of ground motion recording instrumentation also available. So, you can say more or less I am able to detect each and every event, but after before 1940 you see hardly there are any information about earthquake. Some years are there where even in one complete decade no event has been reported. Certainly, it is it's very likely uh, very unlikely that in 10 years not even a single event was reported and on the other end sometime in the, in the year 1991 to 2000 you are having 22 events. So, that does not mean that the uh, does not mean that in this particular decade there was no event at all, but that also add up that you do not have complete information about earthquake which have happened, but because as a result of which there are complete zeros in this particular decade and not only zeros whatever single digits are also mentioned it might also happen that there were many events but since we do not have any information about those events we ended up in getting maybe one event two event three event like that in such a case if we go let us see since 1761 total in last 254 years 134 event has happened as per this particular chart now going with that particular logic number of earthquakes which are happening per year is 0.53. So, because I have taken the entire catalog as complete, if I am interested to find out the frequency of earthquake occurrence, I ended up in getting 0.53. That means, only 0.53 event per year is happening collectively independent of magnitude. On the other hand, as I mentioned from 1920 onward or 1930 onward, suppose there was more monitoring of earth related to earthquake in a particular region, then you see in total 123 events from 1923 itself, uh, from 1921 itself. So, in the last 94 years close to 123 events and last 250 years close to 134 events. So, there is significant jump in the number of earthquakes just because my information about past earthquake is more accurate or more number of earthquake which have actually happened in the past is known to me. So, that will give me in, uh, uh, more confidence about the earthquake catalog which I am dealing with. So, first one is definitely an underestimation whether second one one should go for no or not that we will discuss once uh, uh, one is done with completeness analysis with respect to magnitude and as well as with respect to time. So, now, now see completeness analysis with respect to magnitude, here we are interested to find out what is the minimum magnitude above which I can say that the information about past earthquake is completely known to me. So, here what we have is cumulative frequency distribution plot that means total number of earthquakes of different different magnitude which are known to me is there on x axis. Uh, and uh, cumulative number is there on y axis and the magnitude corresponding to those numbers are there on x axis. So, the maximum curvature method suggests where there is maximum curvature corresponding to that particular point whatever magnitude you are getting this magnitude is basically the magnitude of completeness. Other methods are also there, Memmer and Weiss method and many more methods are there. So, this is going to give you the minimum magnitude with which you can say okay, uh, corresponding to this particular magnitude because we are more interested in larger magnitudes because that cause more damages also and even significant ground shaking also. 
So, now I can say magnitude 4 is my magnitude with respect to the earthquake catalog given to me above which I can say the, the magnitude of completeness is there. Similarly, with respect to time, so step had given uh, method 1972 which I am referring over here. So, suppose x 1, x 2, x 3 are number of events which have happened in each time interval just like I, sh I had shown in the completeness chart. Now, I am interested to find out what is the mean, mean rate. So, I can find out the mean rate n is the number of bins through which these uh, average events are available to me, every number of events are available to me. I can determine the value of mean rate and accordingly I can determine the variance given in by this particular equation. So, I am having the mean value also I know how many number of bins are available or the time interval within which these x 1, x 2, x 3 are given it is corresponding to 1 year. That means, now the number of bins which I had taken into consideration will be equal to the duration for which I will be analyzing the data which is capital T. So, step consider this particular uh, variation follows a Poisson distribution and then accordingly propose that the standard deviation of such a information will be equal to square root of the mean rate of occurrence in a particular region which is corresponding to one particular year divided by capital T which is the total number of bins or the total duration for which the data is available. So, going with this particular part if one is interested to find out the completeness duration we can determine based on the equation given in the previous slide how much is the standard deviation corresponding to different different time interval for last 10 years, 15 years, 20 years because the value of capital T keeps on changing. And remember when I say 10 years that means from today 10 years in the back, from today 20 years, 30 years, 200 years in the past. So, I will be starting from this particular side. I will try, I will, I will plot T versus standard deviation or sigma plot. In addition, I am also plotting another line which will be equals to 1 by square root T line till the moment sigma versus t plot and the line which is again 1 by square root t. So, one side you are having t and other side rather than standard deviation there will be 1 by square root t till the moment these two lines are parallel or these two plots are parallel I can say my earthquake catalog is complete in that particular duration. Suppose in this particular case these two are approximately up to this particular part are parallel and after that you can see there is significant change. So, I can say starting from present 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years this might be developed for one particular magnitude I can say for that particular magnitude for which this particular plot is developed the earthquake catalog is complete for last 50 years. Similarly, in this particular case 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60. So, last 60 years my earthquake catalog is complete the earthquake catalog was having a magnitude of completeness developed based on the previous chart and corresponding to last 50 years or 60 years whatever information is available in my earthquake catalog corresponding to the magnitude for which this particular plot is developed as shown over here. This is corresponding to 4 to 4.9, this is corresponding to 5 to 5.9. So, I can say all the earthquakes which are in 4 to 4.9 if I take for last 50 years those are giving me complete information based on which I can determine my seismic activity. Similarly, 5 to 5.9 in last 60 years how many data are there based on which I can determine the seismic activity of a particular region very accurately. Now, cumulative uh, the completeness with respect to time you can also find out based on cumulative visual method which was pro, uh, 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 proposed by Molargia and Tinti in uh, 1985. So, again here you can see you start plotting cumulative number of earthquakes over the decade and then suddenly you will see after a particular event there is more or less it is following a uniform trend, but there was some stability which is you are you are getting in between the points. So, this particular duration you can say after 1970-1972 onward my earthquake catalog is more or less complete. So, this is another method based on which one can refer to 
the earthquake catalog and determine its completeness. Now, seismic activity. Now, so we have we have declustered the catalog, which was already homogenized. Then, based on completeness analysis, I have found out the rather I need not analyze further uh, based on last 200, 300, 500 years data. Rather, I will only focus on the data which is available, which is corresponding to completeness, uh, which qualifies the completeness criteria with respect to uh, magnitude as well as with respect to time. So, based on this, you will be having some number of events of different different magnitudes. Using those events, just plot how many number of uh, what is the magnitude and how many number of events corresponding to one particular magnitude and above it that will help you in determining what is the cumulatively what is the frequency of different magnitude per year to occur in a particular region of interest. So, log delta m is basically giving you an indication about logarithmic of annual rate of accidents or annual frequency of a particular magnitude and above it which are happening in a particular region of interest. So, log delta m equals to a minus b m. Now, here you can see a is indication of this particular part which can also be interpreted as number of earthquakes corresponding to lowest magnitude. Here it is given as 4. So, I can say number of earthquake corresponding to 4 magnitude. If the plot is given from 0 to uh, maybe 7, 8, then A value will represent number of earthquakes of 0 and above magnitude which are possible in a particular region and B is definitely indicating what is the rate at which different magnitude earthquakes are on an average happening in a particular region of interest. So, B is basically indication of seismic activity and A is indication of cumulative number of earthquakes of particular magnitude and above usually refer to the minimum magnitude which you have used here in development of uh, seismic, uh, seismic activity plot. So, based on this one can determine the seismic activity parameter. Then determination of seismic activity parameter one can go with uh, least square method where based on simply the plot between frequency distribution and cumulative number of earthquakes one can determine what will be the A and B parameter as shown over here. So, in least square method linear regression is done to find out the slope of frequency magnitude distribution and obtain the seismic activity parameter that is A and B. The advantage is least square method or LSM is simple and easy to apply. It has also been observed that estimating the probability of largest magnitude earthquake least square method is more suitable. However, as the cumulative number of earthquakes primarily correlated to higher magnitudes some people have told many researchers have highlighted that LSM should not be used for cumulative data. So, similarly with respect to that maximum likelihood method is also proposed based on which one can determine the probability density function which can be correlated with respect to mean magnitude and minimum magnitude of interest taken into account some increment in terms of magnitude values, one can determine the value of B usually taking the increment to as small as maybe 0 0.1, 0 0.2 depending upon how much earthquake event in your complete earthquake catalog is available to you. So, using those parts again using the governing equation which are mentioned over here, you can determine how much will the value of seismic activity parameter B. So, that is all related to determination of uh, seismic activity parameters as well as how before you start developing seismic activity parameter, how the completeness uh, 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 should be done with respect to magnitude, with respect to time. Similarly, how uh, declustering of earthquake catalog to, depend, to identify independent events or main events and to remove independent uh, dependent events or main shocks or aftershocks such that in the end you will get a catalog which is complete in itself and directly can be used using maximum likelihood method or least square method to determine how much will be the seismic activity of a particular region. So, if we continue the discussion with related to lecture 9, we understood how to identify seismic sources. 
Now, based on this, we have also gathered an earthquake catalog, which is complete in itself. So, this particular earthquake catalog, if you superimpose on seismic source maps, that will help in developing the seismic seismo tectonic map of a particular region of interest. In further lectures, we will also see how this information about seismic sources as well as past earthquakes collectively can be used to determine what is the most likely or what is the worst scenario seismic hazard at your site of interest. Because that is the sole purpose to determine because of earthquake and its associated information known to a person or to the analyst, how much is the expected level of ground shaking at a particular site of interest. So, thank you everyone, we will continue on this particular uh, discussion in the next class. Thank you. Thank you.